I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. And we'll remain standing for the land acknowledgement statement. Tonight, we will be reading the shortened statement that is read at public gatherings and sporting events. Salamanca City Central School District acknowledges the homeland of the Anandawakta, people of the Great Hill, the Seneca people on whose ancestral and modern day land Salamanca School District now stands and on whose water we enjoy. We stand with all indigenous peoples in their resolve to remain connected to their land while we cannot undo what has been done, it is the goal of the Salamanca City Central School District to recognize the history and make improvements that will benefit the next seven generations of Indigenous students. Thank you. Okay, do we have any changes to the agenda? Uh, there are several changes. Um, we added the audit presentation, which uh, we will be seeing shortly. We corrected some dates for FMLA for Diane Bartlett. We added the Tech Edge uh, Consulting Agreement and Resolution. We added the Audit and Corrective Action Plan backup to the resolution. We added the backup to create the clerk position, and we cleaned up some typos. Um, those were all done previous to our review of the um, agenda earlier, um, but were added after it was initially published last week. Okay. So I need to uh, a motion to approve the agenda with the changes. Motion. Motion by Second. Dad. Second by Carrie. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain. Motion carried. Just to note, uh, Flip and Sue are both excused tonight. So we will uh, move on to our recognitions and presentations. So we have a presentation from People Services. Terrific, Mrs. Dudek, our Chief of Student Supports, will be presenting tonight on a host of um, topics, including um, some of the things that she does, as well as uh, registration and enrollment. So thank you so much for allowing me to be here tonight. Um, I'm Mrs. Dudek, I'm very excited to do this. Did you feel a little bit of an idea about people services? We've had people come and ask, and because we have been residing at the Blue House, we've had a lot of candidates in and out, and we thought this was a good time to start to give you an overview of some of the things that happen at our office. So, Marcy, I'm all set. All right. So, people always ask, what do you do if people personnel services? So, today is going to give you that bigger window and that bigger insight. So some things that we cover, and this is not indicative of everything, but it just gives you that window. We cover central registration, and central registration covers a lot of pieces from address changes to working with families to McKinney Vento. I'm going to talk a little bit about McKinney Vento in a few slides from now. We work with foster families. We work with Medicaid, hand in hand with the business office. We work on grants. We work on staff reporting. And STAC is the system for tracking all children in New York State. We also take care of all the deadlines for our data, both for our data with our students, our staff, and examinations and graduation. We have our CSE process, and we also have our CPSE registration and testing, which is a little bit different from our regular registration. Recording in progress. So central registration, some things that we take care of. And in our office, we have Mary Lynn Reeves, who is now our central registrar. She handles everything with myself. And Debbie Woodworth is working hand in hand with Mr. Parisi uh, regarding CPSE and CSE. So what does that mean? When a family registers with us as central registration, we put everything into our power school system. And you'll see in a few slides that power school system feeds all of our data sources. Um, for all that information you ask for as a board and want to know later on down the line from graduation rates to assessments to enrollment. And that's going to be the exciting slide for today. We also determine McKinney Vento status and we meet with the families personally and walk them through that process. And once you hear a little bit more about what McKinney Vento means, I'm hoping you'll have some questions for us. We also work with foster families, CPS, DSS. Um, and we also do all of the address changes, which now our address changes automatically link to the transportation department and help them with their routing. 
So there's no longer paper going back and forth. Once our office changes that address, transportation automatically sees it, and within 12 to 14 hours, it's changed in their routing system. So it's a very smooth process now. So first, we'll start with registration. How do you enroll your student in the Salem Lake City Central School District? Easiest way is that red and gray button right on the main page of salemlakeny.org. If you click on there, it will take you to not only the forms, but the process, everything that you need to bring in, and also gives you that phone number, the 716-945-5142. That will bring you right to Mary Lynn to set up a time to register. What we did was we went from having people just come in and register to having times designated so we're allowed uh, or giving an allotment of about an hour per family. This way we can sit down with the family, we can work with them on situations, we can link them with the correct people in the buildings, and they get a chance to ask us questions that they may not want to ask if there are other families around. Mm -hmm. That really has made a difference in our process and the feedback that we get from the families that come in. So down below there is a link, and on the website um, that link is active and it does show you all of the forms that are needed by the Attorney General in order to register for school. And then how do you update student addresses within the district? Same process. It's calling your office, getting the information to Mary Lynn. The nice thing is, is that with cell phones, iPads, computers, families don't always have to come in now. They can take a picture off their phone, email it to Mary Lynn, and we can make that address change within a few minutes, which is wonderful. We are working with Levi and Power School to have an online change system where families, just like they register online, will be able to go in, put their information in, and upload their documents. There was a glitch, so we have not made it active yet. It is there in the background, and as soon as all the glitches are fixed, we will turn that active. So McKinney-Vento. For those of you that don't know, McKinney-Vento is another term for homelessness. Our office um, meets with a lot of families, and you'll see the next few slides what that looks like in current numbers. For the district, Mr. Mr. Breezy and I are Board approved as McKinney Vento compliance officers, and each of the buildings has someone that is there to assist. You can see at Prospect we have Sam D. Boy and Chris Morrison, Seneca has Chanda Gray, and the high school has Tanya Civilio. We meet with those families, we link them with supports locally, we, meet, we assist the students if they are in an emergency situation with clothes, with food, with materials and supplies. So we ensure that they do not miss out on school. How many homeless families do we have? Great question, Teresa. That is coming up. So, so I'm going to keep you in suspense for two more slides, okay. Okay. and then we will go over that. So this slide just really gives you an overview right from the state of website of what McKinney Vento is. It means that someone lacks a fixed, regular, adequate nighttime residence. There are questions that we do, and it is very difficult sometimes because families don't always want to share that information publicly when there's other people around. So by scheduling those appointments, we meet with them. We talk to them about their situations. We talk to them about the help that we can give them. And we have had a significant increase recent in our community mental students for sure. Transportation still has to occur. So for McKinney Mental students, it is a 50 mile radius. We do have some families right now that are displaced and they were placed by DSS in Westfield. It is our obligation to go to Westfield, pick those students up and bring them back here. So it is a 50 mile radius when a family becomes homeless. And the process is, is that the family can choose to register in the new district under McKinney Vento status or stay with us in Salamanca. And then we are responsible for that transportation back and forth. So it's not just a very simple check a box that someone falls under McKinney Vento. There are a lot of ins and outs. Without the help of our transportation department, they have on a dime worked wonders. They have worked with a lot of our families. Some of our families, uh, one of our families in particular, is on housing location number 15 since September 6th. So these are kiddos that really need that extra help. And the staff at the buildings, the staff in the district have been amazing in making sure that they're getting what they need. But it is a difficult situation and it's something that I wanted to make sure that everyone was aware of and kind of what's going on at this point. So you asked, in 21-22, our year-long total of McKinney Venture students was 37 for the year. 
As of October 1st, we were at 41 for this year already. Each month I attend a training through New York State and the last training that I attended, they had numbers from 2021 and that there were over 99,000 homeless students in New York State in 2021. They're expecting that number to double for this year. So what are the ages? From preschool until age 21. So the 41 that we have now, do we know what our breakdown is? Um, our breakdown right now, we have no preschoolers at the moment. Um, kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. Um, majority of our students are between probably kindergarten and seventh, seventh grade. But that changes. I have an email that I just received before walking in. We have three more that are displaced from another district that um, are homeless and doubled up here in Sydney. So when you say they're homeless in another district, they were going to another district school, but we have to, but they're here now. Is that it's how that, or? Both. Okay. So we have some families that um, are here, they were displaced, they may have been evicted, they may have had uh, something happen where they were no longer allowed to stay in the house that they were in. Mm -hmm. And they have been placed either by DSS or on their own in another district. I work with that McKinney Venture Liaison in that other district to determine, yes, they are, fall under McKinney Vento guidelines. And then we work with them on what's best for the students. Prime example was the child in Westfield. It was a 58 minute ride for a six year old one way. So we work with Westfield, they agreed. They said, we will allow him to register. And as soon as they have a place back with you, which could be at the end of the week, we'll just transfer him right back to you. So the McKinney Vento liaisons around the area are very good at working together to make sure that we do what's right for the students. Um, we have a few students that are in other areas that have the parents have decided to go to remote learning because they've had so many houses in the past three weeks until they can find someplace stable. So the families work very closely with us, the family liaisons, the homeschool coordinators, and the McKinney Mental Liaisons in the buildings have been outstanding in making sure that the families are checked in on every day. But it, it is very difficult for our students. And it's very difficult for the families who are coming to the system. Can you just talk about because sometimes we think when we think of homeless, we think on the streets. But what are some instances that might occur where it, you know you may not fall under the McKenney Vento rules that are not necessarily meaning that you're destitute financially? So it could be that you've been evicted and you're or maybe the house that you are in was sold and the landlord is not allowing you to renew your lease, you have no place else to go. And you now are doubling up with another family member. It could be that you are working with DSS because of a domestic violence situation and they're placing you in a hotel or motel or a shelter. We have had individuals that have moved from other states and were camping in a tent in Allegheny State Park. We have had individuals that have driven a camper that they purchased off of Craigslist and parked it at Allegheny State Park. We have had some children that are unaccompanied youth that for situations beyond their control are no longer allowed to be in their home. Um, maybe it could be due to domestic violence or drugs and they have decided to exit the home and they fall under uh, unaccompanied youth steps. So there are different situations and that's why it is imperative Every time someone registers, the first two pages that we have to have them fill out is a housing questionnaire. And that housing questionnaire very commonly asks, are you in a permanent residence? Are you doubled up? And the nice thing about having our clerical staff work with them after they register is they can ask those underlying questions. So they might check that they're in permanent housing, but they might start to talk to the clerical staff about how I'm now doubled up and my kids are sleeping on the floor at night, which does not constitute fixed, regular, adequate nighttime residence. Does that answer your question? Yeah. And can you also just touch base on some of the requirements for registration? Because if, if we didn't know, like change an address, okay, big deal. Why is that like a big deal? And some of the maybe regulations that go into all that? Because even the registration process sounds pretty simple, right? You just come in, hey, I'm here, just sign me up for classes, mm -hmm. let's roll. No, not that simple. So some things that they do have to, when you're registering a new student, we have to have proof of residency. So the attorney general actually outlined some things that we need. And thanks to the board years ago, when we took over central registration, 
having things notarized was one of the things we did take off the table to make it a little bit easier for our families. So because of that, things that we need are proof of residency, a letter from the landlord or the person you are renting the house from showing your name, their name, address, telephone number. We then have things, um, mortgage statements, lease statements, tax bills. Um, and then they have to have a letter coming to that address and that name. And it sounds interesting, but mm -hmm. sitting through some of the cases that I have to listen to when we go through some of the trainings, um, not as much obviously in this area of Western New York, but more towards New York City where people are going for different spots. We have to do definitely look at that. Why is it so important? Because every person that we register, that information then feeds up to Karen for mm -hmm. Impact 8 and also all of our grants. So anything that happens at registration doesn't just mean getting a bus schedule for the next day or getting into the right building. It actually means that we have to verify with the state how the funding is being used for that family. If they are a family that qualifies for free and reduced lunch, that impacts one part of our grants and one part of the state reporting for Karen and the business office. Um, if they are on territory, there is other information that Karen needs then to validate once we determine what their address is. So even though that registration process is very simple, it's the behind the scenes process that happens afterwards that's a little bit more complicated. So sometimes we have to ask for additional information or information to clarify. That's why it's so important when we do an address change, because if they're counting under one piece of information and data going to the state, and all of a sudden their address puts them into a different category, we need to know that information. Okay. Okay. So the importance of the data that we put in is it feeds our information in level zero, level one, and level two. Mm -hmm. And that is a whole day's training, not something that we want to do just in the board meeting tonight <laughs> in presentation. Um, but those are reviewed weekly. Um, level zero, I actually now look at daily, especially because we just had Beds Day, which is our basic data, a basic educational data system. And that's where all of our information and all of our funding for next year comes out of that day, which was last Wednesday. So we always want to make sure that our information in our power school is accurate. It then pushes to level one where it gets cleaned and we have some great visualizations that have been shared with the staff. And then level two is what gets reported out to the state. So other things that are reviewed out of our office is child find. We have had and we work hand in hand with DSS where um, if they have children that they have been alerted that are of school age and not attending school, they will call our office and we work with them hand in hand. We work on attendance records, and that's one of our goals for this year for our office is meeting with the building clerks and the building principals to make sure that their attendance is correct. We make sure that all the test results are in. Keep an eye on those graduation rates and who's entering and exiting. Special education data, obviously the data for grants in the business office, and then enrollment. Any questions so far before I start to touch on enrollment? So as of October 1st, 2022, the enrollment in what are called our district and out of district reportable sites was 1,434 students, our highest number that we've had in over six years. And I couldn't go back any further because the data system wouldn't let me go back any further and stop right there. Um, what does out of district sites and district sites that includes Prospect, Seneca, the high school, Warrior Academy, BOCES, and St. Mary's? So when I talk about the district sites, including out of district reportable, it includes that both season St. Mary's piece. So I wanted to give everybody kind of a bigger picture. The charts that you see in front of you right now only talk about the enrollment of Prospect, Seneca, the high school, and Warrior Academy. Our footprints. Back in 2017, 2018, our overall enrollment was 1,200 students. You jump ahead to 22-23, our footprint enrollment is up to 1,327, and that has increased since I created this PowerPoint slide. So when people say, even though our overall enrollment of 1,434 has been semi-consistent, up by about five or 10 the past few years, we've actually, on our footprint, grown 127 students in six years. Below you can see the red is prospect, 
the light gray is Seneca and the dark gray is the High School and Warrior Academy. And you'll see a little bit more in detail on the next slides what that looks like per building. So prospect, we did have a little bit of a dip in enrollment this year, but it is coming back up. We have had a consistent enrollment almost every day of people coming in. So this gives you an idea of where we were in 1718 and where we are now for 2223. Seneca is again back on that rise. So our highest was 1920 with 408, similar to 1819. We did drip, uh, drop down a little bit during that COVID time, but we are back up to 379. High school has been the continual rise. High school in 1718 was 376, and high school as of the last poll was 508. And that does include the students that are at Warrior Academy as well. So where have some of these students come from? It's our out of district, not reportable sites. So this shows um, places like Elgaville, Southern Church Catholic Archbishop Walsh, and then other. That other category includes places like St. Francis, uh, New Christian Life, and Nichols. So our Elegantville in 1718, there were 100 students that were uh, tuition paying at Elegantville. That number is down, down to 59. Same with Southern Church Catholic Archbishop Walsh, it was at 46. We are now at 19. So again, just wanted to give you a visualization of how our district footprint itself has been increasing and where some of those students have been coming from. So our office is always asking a ton of questions. We are always asking for more information. We're always looking for that other piece of information that we need to provide. Without the help of Levi, the building clerical staff, the business office, transportation, technology, the administrators, nurses, liaisons, and especially the families. Without everyone working together, we wouldn't have everything where we have it to this point, and we're excited to see it continue to grow. These are just a piece of what we do in our office. There are other pieces. I will not bore you tonight, but with it being the start of the year, I wanted to present to you where we are with our enrollment and with our McKinney Mental students. Any questions? Yeah, where, where did you say, or didn't you, Big Picture and Rise Academy, mm -hmm. where are they? They fall under the BOCES category. So the on the uh, slide that says the out of district reportable, yeah. that 1434, those students fall within that number. So it's 1327 in our footprint, and BOCES and St. Mary's makes up the difference between 1327 and the 1434. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, John Moore, I just wanted to go back a little bit. Oh, sorry. That's it. Why did you say 99,000 in New York State of homeless children is going to double? Um, they said last year that it was about 135. And in New York City, they are seeing a significant amount of students that are homeless. Mm -hmm. So they had um, families that come in that are displaced from weather, tornadoes, hurricanes, um, immigration status especially um, your unaccompanied youth. So in their last piece, they were looking at that number as well. They're waiting for the bed stay, which was just this past Wednesday, and that information will trickle up to the state. Um, that information will be available closer to January 18th. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, next up, we have our um, audit from uh, Ms. Young. Karen, do you want to introduce her, give her a little rundown? Sure, this is Mary Young on uh, Zoom, and she requested to, to be Zoom tonight because there's a bunch of other districts that she's trying to get through as well. <laughs> so uh, instead of driving down here and missing those other ones, we, you know, we did the Zoom thing. So Mary is our lead audit uh, person from Lumsden McCormick out of Buffalo, and she will be running through our presentation for the FYE 2022 audit. It's all yours, Mary. Should right. be able to share your screen. Yes, I will. Thank you so much. It's so nice to see everyone, even though it's uh, virtual. Um, uh, can you see this? Yes. Yep. Okay. 
Great. So um, as Karen mentioned, this is our audit report for the 2021-22 20, uh, year. And Sarah Dayton, who's the partner in charge of this engagement, presented to the audit committee a couple weeks ago um, the presentation. So we're just presenting to the board now. Um, audit scope and results. We've got the deliverables, auditor's report on financial statements. It's an unmodified opinion. It's the highest um, level, a clean audit. It's the highest level you can achieve. The auditor's report required by government auditing standards, which is a requirement for school districts. And we had no findings or matters there. And then also the auditor's report on compliance for each major federal program and on internal control as required by the uniform guidance. Um, just as a reminder, you are required to have this audit under uniform guidance because you spend more than $750,000 in federal funds in the year. So you actually had $16,862,000 that uh, you had spent um, in 2022 compared to about 10 million last year. Uh, the biggest increases were, were um, more spending of the impact aid, about $4.8 million more of impact aid spent. Um, and then also about 1.8 million more in education stabilization funds. Uh, we are required, you are considered a low risk audit E because you haven't had any findings in the past few years. So we're required to test 20% of your federal funds. Um, however, we ended up testing 92%. And the reason for that was um, you received more federal funds in your school lunch program. So that brought your school your child nutrition cluster group of programs, um, you received about 985,000 in funds there. And that put you, that, that category, that group over the $750,000 threshold. And because it hadn't been um, tested in the past two years, it had to be tested again. And then same thing with your education and stabilization fund that was also over 750,000 in spending and also hadn't been tested in the past two years. So we had to test that one. And unfortunately, those two programs got us to 18%. So we were just shy of the 20%. So we also tested impact aid to get us over the 20%. So a lot of testing there in the federal funds. And then uh, the data collection form is just a summary of all the federal funds and the spending you did. Uh, we will work with Karen to, um, to prepare that and she'll certify it, we'll certify it. Unfortunately, the Federal Clearinghouse uh, website it has not been updated for the 630 2020 uh, 2022 uh, audit year. So we're, we're just waiting for that to be updated and we're hoping that'll be updated soon so we could get working on that. We also have the report on the extra classroom activities, schedule of additions and deductions. Um, beginning um, amount of money was about 61,000. You had a, almost 112,000 of fundraising and about 115,000 of um, amounts that were spent by the uh, student clubs, getting you down to about 58,000. You're right around where you were pre-pandemic. Um, we're, we're definitely seeing the, the levels higher than they were last year, and you're, you're right around where you were um, prior to COVID. And then also the communication with those charged with governance letter and the management letter. Uh, required communications, that's a communication with those charged with governance, just lays out our responsibilities, the plan, uh, scope and timing of the audit, our compliance with ethical requirements, including independence, uh, significant accounting policies, estimates, and disclosures. Uh, the district, as all school districts, were required to implement government auditing standard 87 that had to do with leases. So this required um, the recording of the rental of the Westgate Hotel and the BOCES assets as a right to use asset on your financial statements. So that was a, a pretty big change there. Uh, some estimates, capital assets, Unearned revenue, which is your Native American tuition and impact aid, mostly your impact aid, compensated absences, pens pensions, OPEB, and any reserves, 
and the significant uh, footnote disclosures are note two, which talks about the change in accounting principle having to do with GASB 87 leases, stewardship and compliance, which, um, which discloses that you are over 4%, uh, your unassigned fund balance is over 4% of next year's budget or the 2023 budget. Uh, your long-term liabilities and the payments that are required for those, and then your pensions and your other post-employment benefits. This is also where we would let you know if we had any difficulties performing the audit or any disagreements with management, or if there were any material uh, misstatements or um, anything like that that we should let you know about. We had none of those issues. For the management letter, just some observations and some things that um, we um, were a result of our audit, no material weaknesses. That basically means that your internal controls are such that um, there had there a material misstatement of the financial statements, if that were to occur, um, would not be prevented, detected, or corrected. And your internal controls are strong enough that that, that type of situation wouldn't happen. So no material weaknesses is a wonderful thing to see. Um, you've also got um, a comment or the observation about your fund balance exceeding 4%. Capital assets, some do, there are some reconciliations between what the financial statements have and what your third party uh, company that uh, basically runs the reports and keeps your fixed asset detail. Um, we will be meeting with Karen and we're gonna go through that so that that gets resolved this year. And then just some uh, recommendations for your extra classroom clubs, just reminding the faculty advisors and the students that they need to be signing the forms and also some recommendations as it um, has to do with the concession, concession stand and the inventory there. And then there's three new accounting standards that are coming up, uh, GASB 96 having to do with software and subscription-based technology, which will be implemented in the year we're in now. Uh, GASB 100, which is just some clarifications on any counting changes or error corrections, and that'll be the year after. And then GASB 101, which has to do with uh, compensated absences and just clarifying and further defining the definition, definition of leave and how that should be recorded on a government-wide basis. And that'll be in 2025. Summary of funds. This is the summary of uh, fund balance. Uh, probably for the general fund, the biggest um, change in fund balance there was with your committed funds. You did, uh, the board did approve adding more funds to the committed um, group for technology and for capital outlay, and also uh, two new committed funds were also um, approved and those were starting to be funded as well. So that's where you saw the kind of the biggest increase in your uh, fund balance categories. Your restrictive fund balance did increase a little bit, mostly having to do with your retirement contributions, which is your teacher's retirement and employee's retirement, uh, the district's required, uh, um, required payments um, and contributions to those retirement funds. And then you can see your designated for subsequent year, which is for the 2023 year was, was consistent with the prior year and a little bit of a change in encumbrances, which brings us down to the unassigned fund balance of about $24 million. For our capital projects, we had an increase in your fund balance there. Uh, you did transfer about $6 million into your capital projects fund from your general fund. You've also had some spending on your 2019 and 2017 projects. So those are the expenditures we've seen there. Um, but overall, your fund balance did go up mostly because of that transfer of the $6 million from the general fund. Um, special aid, uh, you did have about $2 million more in special aid of uh, revenue this year, having to do with the American Rescue Plan and the um, other COVID uh, coronavirus funding that the federal government's been giving school districts. Uh, school lunch, there was an increase in aid there, as I mentioned, which triggered the um, audit of the federal funds in that. Uh, that fund, um, and you are in the process of moving um, that 
or have moved all of um, your um, school lunch into in-house. So we're seeing some you know, employee benefits and things like that that were recorded in um, the school lunch fund in 2022. No change in debt service and the mis miscellaneous special reserve is your scholarships and some other non-student uh, activity, non-extra class activities. General fund revenue. State aid, very consistent year to year. Um, it only increased about $200,000. Your impact aid did increase about 4 million. You, you spent more of that. So more of that revenue was recognized in 2022 compared to 2021. Property tax is the same. Other is basically everything else. And there was a decrease in your Native American tuition aid that was recognized in 2022. Mostly that's because in 2021, a larger amount was recognized because you had been waiting to receive some funds. And in 2021, you had received quite a bit more from New York State um, just because there was a delay. So in 2022, you're kind of back to, to where you would have been before. And then the other um, thing that was recorded in that other revenue category is the, um, the um, tribal compact funds that you received again. And that was about $1.4 million. So there had been a break in receiving that, that money or there had been a delay in receiving that money. And so then that's starting to come back too. So overall your uh, revenue decreased about 1% uh, year to year in the general fund. And then looking at your expenditures, Salaries uh, went up about 6.8%, about $1.2 million. Uh, you had about 4% raises for a lot of your collective bargaining units. You also had new hires. I will also say that even though this is just focused on the general fund expenditures, with the additional ARPA funds that you received that were recorded in special aid, you did have about a $1.3 million increase in salaries in the special aid fund as a result of those additional funds that came in. Employee benefits, um, that increased about 2.8%. Um, there was a small decrease in the <laughs> systems, uh, not so much TRS, the rates had increased for both ERS and TRS, um, but ERS was a little bit lower. And I think that's because some of the um, people who had been paid through the general fund were probably being paid through either school lunch or special aid. And then uh, health insurance uh, was uh, consistent based on the salaries that were that you had, and then also payroll taxes went up a little bit because your salaries went up. Debt service decreased based on your principal payments um, that are required uh, by your amortization schedules. Both these services increased mostly due to. Um, services provided to students with disabilities. And then also the new distance learning program that was about $300,000 more um, <clears throat> funding for that of uh, spending there. And then transportation and other is really just you purchase land of about $500,000. You purchased a few parcels of land. And then also you had um, your BOCES capital payment, which also increased your BOCES services. So there was a lot of what was happening with those expenditures. Overall, your expenditures did increase about 6.5%, um, but most of that had to do with salaries, as I said, um, with a little bit more for BOCE services. The government-wide summary and reconciliation, uh, just as a reminder, this shows the government-wide portion of the financial statements show all of your capital assets on the balance sheet, all of your debt on the balance sheet. It also shows any liabilities um, that you might have um, having to do with your pension plans and your other post-employment benefits. So looking at this one, um, capital assets, uh, the increase there is really just a function of the current year operating results. Capital assets increased. Again, you had your capital project um, uh, <clears throat> projects that you spent money on and then also purchase of um, other equipment, including buses. 
Long-term liabilities, as I said earlier, de decrease based on what you were required to pay, um, the principal that you were required to pay on your debt. And other liabilities, uh, the increase there is really just an increase in the unearned impact aid. And basically what that says is, uh, this is impact aid that you haven't recognized the expenses yet for. So when those expenses are recognized, then the revenue gets recognized and you have more impact aid that you're waiting to uh, recognize as revenue than you did last year. And then the pension OPEB and deferred resources category, uh, that just has to do with your employee and teacher retirement system and your other post-employment benefits. You receive actuarial reports that say what liabilities or what assets um, the district might have this year for all school districts. Uh, TRS and ERS are actually net pension assets uh, versus liabilities last year. So um, uh, that basically says that TRS and ERS are both over 100% funded right now. And a lot of this just has to do with changes in discount rates and healthcare cost trends, and even just a small decrease or increase one way or the other on these dis discount rates can really change those assets to liabilities very mm -hmm. So a lot of this just has to do with the actuarial uh, tables, inflation rates, you know, we're seeing high in higher inflation that the actuaries have prepared. And then down here at the bottom of this page is just a reconciliation between the fund statements and the government-wide statements, just showing you how um, the different categories affected. So capital assets was an increase, long-term liabilities was an increase, there was a decrease in the amount of Native American tuition that was included in unearned revenue, the impact of uh, GASB 87 and GASB 84 the last year, and also the pension, OPEP, and a, a couple other small items gets us to our total government wide. And then this page just basically summarizes what I just said about the page before. <laughs> so read that at your leisure. <laughs> I know you can't wait. And then that's it. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, just bank of revenue. So in the other then, so we already, you, you mentioned, we touched on that we already collected, was it 1.4 million from the Seneca casino funds? Yes, you received about 1.4 million in revenue in 2022 from the tribal compact. Okay. And when was that received? I want to say it was late May. Um, I read it in the paper before we actually got it. <laughs> <laughs> Just like the last, like two weeks ago, there was an article that said that we received $35,000. Well, we still don't have that. Right. So. Um, but I want to say it was in late May that we got that. That we actually got the payment? Yeah. Okay. 1.4 mil. Yep. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Thanks, Mary. All right. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care, everyone. All right. We do have one more presentation. Ms. Beatty. It's going to be talking to us about our professional learning, professional development plan. Yes, and uh, thank you very much for casting that, or approving it, I should say, back in August when I was, that was in September, sorry, I was son of my daughter's, or the first of my grandson, so I appreciate you approving the plan with me not being here to go through it with you. Um, basically, the state has changed, they say professional learning now instead of professional development, same thing, but they've changed development to learning, so you're going to hear that a lot more now. Um, what I'm going to do is go, first of all, through our professional learning plan that had to get sent to the state. Thank you for just doing that. You just distracted Mark. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it probably was. That was fancy. I like that. Yeah, that was pretty hey, guys. Really? All right. <laughs> so, um, Basically, this is our plan for the 22-23 school year. And I'm going to just go through the, the learning plan with you. And then I'm also going to talk about our summer PD that will carry over into our school year, which already has carried over. Um, basically, on our professional learning plan, the main things we talked about were 
we had to on your on plan you saw where the vision introduction the learning committee ctla requirements philosophy behind our plan um mandatory trainings we have our mentoring program teachers and bilingual and yellow you know, education and then we had to choose two um, goals for our professional or we they could have we could choose as many as we wanted to so basically we chose some a uh, couple of goals from our decent plan figure they would go hand in hand not reinvent the wheel okay so here's our vision go on mr mm. Wheeler. okay <laughs> And this vision goes back to our um, strategic planning committee from a couple of years ago. And uh, basically, um, that had to be in our professional learning plan that was submitted to the state, you know, to raise the resilient professional players and just, you know, so maximize the potential of our And we also had to have an introduction piece. And uh, this is just the short of a long introduction, but basically, it focuses on. Um, like basically as an adult learning, um, you know, our goal is to, as Dr. Beeler always says, improve teaching and learning um, for our students. You know, we try to make our professional learning continuous, sustainable. And uh, basically, we have included all of our, like, basically every, like the framework goals are our professional learning goals for classroom teachers. Um, transportation department, you name it, it goes, you know, faculty, staff, everywhere, um, food service, teacher assistant, and we want it all to be sustainable. Uh, we also had to include our professional learning committee. These are the people that were on our committee that, um, but I, I won't read these all to you, but there's just so many people that help with the professional development committee. There's basically every principal that had input, all of our directors, um, our assistant principals, um, we had you, like anybody, we had we had PD for safety, like every group you can imagine and everybody has had input into it. Um, Marcy, like you name it, like everybody we had Everybody in, in this room that has had input into it. Our actually, Mrs. Dionne, she's already had some input into it, and Dr. Beeler, obviously. Um, basically, during our professional learning meetings, we would talk about basically um, the needs of professional development. We've gone over, we put out a professional learning survey every survey every year for get the input of our faculty and staff as to what they need. Um, and we liked having the, the classroom teachers and those that are actually in the trenches, they hear what the good and the bad, the ugly is, but how things are going. Um, basically, we we also have at the end of like our mentor and peer, we actually ask the mentor, the, our new mentees, like, what else do you need for for professional learning. So we try to hit everybody basically. <clears throat> um, basically, we had to talk about we have all of our professional development has to have TTLA requirements. Basically, it's our continuing teacher leader education requirements. Anything basically has to be within like a certification area and be new learning for our teachers in order to receive like the APL that they receive. Like they're in a form of professional opportunities. <clears throat> uh, our philosophy, again, this is a very long statement in the entire plan, but basically, we want our professional learning to be high quality, research based, ongoing, and meet the needs of our district, community, and all of our faculty and staff. <clears throat> So we also have some required professional learning that everybody has to take in our district. And there, you can see these listed up here. Um, we've added a couple on ourselves. The state has now added on um, autism, which is, uh, Mr. Priesty has now someone that's gonna help us with some autism training. Um, no before is our cybersecurity. Um, Dr. Beeler has an assist bias course. The others you see on here, 
are basically um, from our safe schools training where everybody takes off the sector. We also had to include our mentoring program in there. Um, so basically each new employee, teacher, teacher aide, teacher assistant is assigned a mentor. Our mentors get trained on the mentor program. They'll go through training in usually August. And uh, <clears throat> we meet with our, they meet with their mentees outside of the school day, during the school day, they'll go shadow or they'll, they'll have set up observations for their mentee to watch other teachers. We also have meetings once a month outside of the school day where we usually bring in like a speaker. It could be uh, like Mr. Long may be talking about ATPR. We had uh, the liaison, like explain how the liaisons work in our district. We had our Native American curriculum team come and speak. We usually have a speaker every month as well as teaching our new mentors, our mentees, excuse me, like classroom engagement strategies, like we like we'll bring a Kagan strategy, so they have that ongoing engagement. Um, they also fill out a survey at the end of the school year, like I had said. <clears throat> One other thing we had to include in here is our teachers in bilingual and ELL education. Just the basically the state put this in for us that they have to have like the fifty percent like TTLE hours and a minimum of fifty percent in language acquisition. Our district actually uses CA BOCES. If we need any services, we have um, CA BOCES can assist us with that. <clears throat> and like I said, we had to have goal setting in our professional learning plan. And we, we took two of our four goals that were off of our DSIP plan to work on using evidence based peer one instructional practices in the classroom. And then to like increase our literacy, literacy instruction daily. <laughs> because actually, like this, this goes hand in hand. A lot of our professional development is with instructional strategies. And it made just the most amount of sense to, like I said, not reinvent the wheel. Um, so, like the goal setting, <clears throat> or excuse me, the tier one instructional, that tier one is like when you are teaching the entire classroom at the same time, like all students, but they're all receiving. And we, we worked a lot, like we said, on literacy also, like with reading, writing, um, trying to look more at reading nonfiction texts. A lot of what we try to use, like evidence based, is like student engagement, engagement proceed, and student engagement, um, behavior, academic success, looking at standards, data, that sort of thing. <clears throat> And basically, how do we select our professional opportunities? We look at the New York State report card, um, New York State district assessments, just basic report cards, our local assessments, and like I told you, we have professional development needs assessment surveys. <clears throat> so, like goes out to the entire staff. So this is just a breakdown of our professional development. These are some things that were, I won't read these to you, but like these are the um, different initiatives we've had in our professional learning. So basically we try and fit it along with, we talked about that goes along with our community and our schools. So these are courses that were taught over the summer, or I should say offered and taught. And you know, some of them will continue throughout the school year, but we focus on equity and diversity. Sure. Um, cultural perspectives, we do sign up for one, two, three, and four. There is a fourth um, that these are courses that were developed and they, they take place over at the museum. And then you can see all of the other courses that get accepted to the museum. The other thing is like, especially with the new teachers, they every, every year each teacher or teacher assistant sets professional development learning goals as to like what they need. And when we hire new teachers, we sit down with them and we talk of like, we look at our different initiatives and what, what may they, we may have a 14 year teacher that comes in here with 14 years experience, but they 
maybe one of their goals is going to be cultural perspectives because you know that we are on a major year um, plan and so they they may want experience with this or poverty somebody may come from somewhere that they don't have a high poverty <laughs> Yeah, absolutely you're gonna bop me in the sorry <laughs> sorry um basically the here we go here's our courses on student um student poverty and so we are working the uh, three restorative practices is a three-year um initiative we have the landmark restorative solutions i think we had talked a little bit about that before because they have um they can help us with like the fidelity and the sustainability of it um, each building has a team that has a sort of practice team as well as there's a uh, district level team. Basically, restorative practices is working like local students, um, building those relationships, having like that conversation with the students rather than it's like an immediate like penalty or discipline, disciplinary action they have restorative circles like they can bring in like students teachers parents whoever just it's been uh, we started like we, we worked on it before COVID hit we started but then uh, we hired the restorative solutions we posted them elegant one so we post these And then instructional strategies, we really try to focus on cleaning our teachers plates and a lot of what came out of like came into this, the courses we offer. Through like the COVID and the learning lag, we ended up uh, where we found that our fourth graders were struggling with phonics. That they, so we had to bring in, you know, fourth, third down struggling with phonics. Our younger ones were struggling with phonemic awareness because they never got that. So we basically have tried to look at things that are going to help catch up our learning lag as well as give those foundational skills to the kids. Um, so things like even in like vertically align our, our So then do you, do you track everything, Penny? Like who takes what? So if one of the principals wanted to know if there was a teacher that you know needed to help them with phonetic awareness, you'd be able to say, well, they did take this training or mm -hmm. there's yep. okay. Yep. And one of the goals we do have is to take um set up a program for our new hires and with some of the things that like chances are really like classroom management. Like that course is extremely important for teachers to take. If you don't have classroom management, it's going to be very difficult to teach your curriculum. So, we're, what we want to do is come up with a list of like maybe year one, we're going to focus on this, and then year two. So, you but can we, we give have them track yep, yeah, in our sure. professional development app. Um, you know, basically, what we've been doing a lot this summer is like basic, like the, concept, the conceptual learning, basic foundations that and trying to catch them up, as well as move those kids that they don't need to be, they need to be moved along or moved ahead as well. Um, yeah, and like I said, there's so many people that put so much into this and give, um, and like a, like a thank you to Karen McGarra. She like work so hard with all the conferences and everything that people get sent to and we have to like these forms we have to sign and sometimes they're not complete whatever it's just and the conferences you allow us all to go to and there's a lot of people that work very very hard Tim Smith is another one that collects all the teachers APO and sends it to the business office for payment and um, the coaches that have worked so hard with the that meetings and TV and all of that. Um, like I said, all the directors, all the principals, everybody has input and direction. So, and the faculty is so thank you. Awesome. Sounds okay. like a ton of work all the time. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. All right. Good job, Penny. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll move on to communications.
see if anybody from Title IV or Title VI. Going to slides here. <laughs> <laughs> Any uh, <laughs> no other public communications. All right. We'll move on to central office message. I want to start with Ms. Junichi. All right. Sure. So let's see. Two weeks. It's uh, been a very productive two weeks. Um, a lot of listening, a lot of learning. Um, it, none of it would have taken place without this room right here. Most of you uh, I've met one-on-one -on -one with or in small groups. In two weeks, I've been able to have 16 entry plan meetings um, with either individuals or groups. Uh, they're very helpful. I can learn what they do, their roles, their responsibilities, their departments. Um, I know uh, Kristen left, but I have to thank Kristen because Kristen carved out um, a large amount of time to sit with me to learn all of the grants and where our funding comes from. It's really thorough and I got a complete understanding of that. Um, last Friday on October 7th, we had our first superintendent's conference day. And I want to thank the principals who um, held uh, grade level meetings, invited me and allowed me to have some input. And they ran amazing meetings to get teachers inspired to, you know, teach with kids. Um, I want to thank Dr. Simbridge for finalizing our MTSS plan. She will eventually be presenting that to you. And we are in the final stages of an attendance plan. And that is just about done and will be done probably by Thursday this week. Okay, I've covered everything for right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Sounds like you've been busy. That's good. Karen? Well, I'm not nearly as organized as that. <laughs> <laughs> um, geared up for several different reviews on a lot of our grant line. We have just over $11 million in education stabilization funds. And um, each one of them has to be reviewed. We have to do all these different things for the state. Um, to basically say we spent the money the way we said we did. So we have to prove that. So I have to go through all those plus the transparency reporting. So that's what I'm working on primarily um, at this point. And then jumping into and have started working on the 23, 24 budget process. I have to get my years right. We're finishing 22, we're in 23, we're doing 24. Yeah. Um, so that's happening. And then um, on the cafeteria end, I need a few parents and student volunteers to be in what I call the lunch bunch that they can um, provide insight as to the good, bad, and the ugly as regards to um, the cafeteria and things that they'd like to see. You know, what types of foods do they like? Do they, is the staff good? Um, you know, do they feel like they're waiting in line too long because of short staffing or is, is that kind of stuff fine and all that kind of thing. So I have um, a teacher from Prospects, two from Seneca and one from a high school. It's actually Chad's going to be doing that one from a high school to help us with our wellness policy. So I need a couple staff or um, parents and a couple students to assist in that as well. Um, so if anybody's interested, please get a hold of me and um, Soon we'll get through our wellness policy and get it to the board to approve because it's been a number of years since it's uh, been revamped and God only knows if we do it after it. Okay. And that's about it for right now. Does anyone have any questions for Karen? All right, we'll go on to the board message. <laughs> Pat, can we start with you? I don't have anything this week. All right. Brad? Yeah. Carol? I think I'm good too. Oh, it's going to be quick. Like, oh. Oh. <laughs> All right, everyone wants to get out of here. I'll keep it rolling. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, uh, I guess I'll keep it rolling too then. No, no, you got to talk for all of us. Okay. <laughs> I can talk for all of us. I can do that. Do How many minutes do you want me to talk? That's something I watch. I'm going to set a timer for 14 and a half minutes. All right, well. <laughs> First, I'd just like to say thanks to all the presenters because it's always good to hear like what everybody is doing in the school. Um, it's very exciting. It's nice that our enrollment numbers, even though Kristen's not here, that our enrollment's going up instead of going down. It's nice to see that 
we are making progress because kids are coming back to our district. And I know that we have a few kids that are coming from other districts here, um, which is exciting because that's what we want is to be the best district around. At least that's what I want. We want to make our kids smarter, right, Carrie? Yeah, that's right. That's our number one goal that we always want to do. So it's pretty exciting. I know um, all of our sports teams are doing good. I know football team is doing good. I got a chance to watch a couple games. Um, and so hopefully I can get to more sporting events before we let go and watch those and all the other extracurricular that we have going on. So everybody just keep up the good work. And I will turn it over to Dr. Dealing. All right. Agree, but whatever. <laughs> Close enough. We have a very exciting time coming up. School Board Appreciation Week begins oh, next yeah. Monday. Oh, um, I believe we have some recognition gifts uh, that are going to be presented this evening, as well as some that will be presented next week, as well as some that are probably going to be coming into board meeting that's coming up in two weeks. Oh, so cool. we are essentially turning this into Board Appreciation Month which would still not go far enough to express the gratitude that our community has for the dedication and time that each of our school board members provide to our district and to our students. So thank you. Mrs. Brown, do you have some things in things you'd like to? All right, Mrs. Brown is the president of our administrators association. I'd like to say it only gifts, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you should. And, every, and, every, and everybody knows that I like months too, because I have a birthday Great month. month. That's <laughs> and that's <way> <laughs> well, and I let Mark down just a little bit when he came and I told him I didn't make anything myself. Oh, so I'll uh, save that for Christmas. And I'll make something nice for Christmas. Thank you. Thank you. You're amazing. Oh, yeah. You guys have been much. I appreciate you guys doing this. Without a doubt, to make my day more exciting every day. So, that's the love. Thanks. So, it's much fun. Did you get a class? Did you go to yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love the great film. And we love the other one. These little things here came from Prospect. Uh -huh. From one of our uh, kindergarten classrooms. Thank you. <laughs> oh, they really oh, can't ignite you. Them. Oh, thank you. And wanted you to just touch base on, I don't know, we haven't had the presentation here before. Uh, so if one of you just talk briefly about what's in the frame. So I just asked um, Mrs. Mrs. Berry, will you do that? Okay. Uh, in the frame is a picture of the wampum belt that Seneca Intermediate made. Which was presented at a uh, building uh, assembly you know, about three weeks ago. So I don't know if you just want to touch base a little bit about what that is, because I don't know if you always fully know. So last spring, spring spend worked with um, just someone from the Iroquois uh, Museum and Professor Hamill uh, from Rochester, and they worked with a group of students from Summit Intermediate to create a wampum belt that represents our cultures and beliefs um, at the school. And so the students presented what they wanted from their ideas, and then they brought it to the panel who then created it over the summer, and the presentation they presented to Seneca working on creating a class, uh, class 
Thank you. Um, so just a couple other thoughts. I uh, also wanted to extend my gratitude to Mrs. Canelli and Mr. Heppel. Um, they are our high school student government advisors. Um, I had the opportunity to meet with our student leaders on the topic of inappropriate student behavior and the district code of conduct that I mentioned at our last board meeting. Mr. Siebert, Mr. Long, Mrs. McGarra, and I had a very productive meeting and we will be presenting uh, more to the board very shortly. I also wanted to express my gratitude to Mrs. Giannici and Mrs. Beaver for their recent work on the district attendance plan. We know that one of our board goals is to focus on improving school and student attendance. Over the next couple of weeks, they will be presenting a, or holding a public hearing, and then we'll be looking to present the plan to the Board of Education for approval. So thank you very much to you two ladies as well. Well, thank you everybody for the wonderful gifts. Yes, it is uh, very much appreciated. Um, we don't look for recognition, but it's nice when we do get it. So thank you. We'll move on to our consent agenda. And we need a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion. Motion Second. by Dale. Second by, is it Pat? Brad. Or Brad. By Brad. Are there any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion for. We do not have any old business. Uh, under new business, we have our change orders for phase 3.3, uh, and they're actually savings, so that's good news. So we need a motion to approve the four change orders that were listed above. Motion. Motion by Dale. Second. Second by Carrie. Are there any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. Item B is uh, the creation of a perk position, a part time for 20 hours a week at uh, $16 an hour. So we need a motion to approve the creation of that position. Motion. Motion by Tad. Second. Second by Brad. Are there any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. Item C is we have some items that we are declaring surplus. They're listed in the agenda. So we need a motion to approve all the items as surplus. Motion. Second. Motion by Tad, second by Dale. Are there any questions on any of the surplus items? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. Uh, item D is the standard workday and reporting resolution that was updated. So we need a motion to approve the standard workday. Motion. Motion by Dale. Second. Second by Brad. Are there any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. Item E is our acceptance of the fiscal year on June 30th audit and uh, the corrective audit action plan. So we need a motion to approve the audit and the action plan. Motion. Second. Motion second. by Tad, second by Kerry. Are there any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. Item F is our consulting agreement with Tech Edge, uh, and that is through October 1st of 2022 through June 30th of 2023 with a maximum uh, not to exceed amount of 32,000. So we need a motion to approve that contract. Motion. Motion by Brad. Second. Second by Dale. Are there any questions on the contract? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain, motion carried. And next is our uh, seeker negative declaration uh, and our lease for zero burn. That's right. right. Starting at the beginning. <laughs> Starting at the beginning. So we need a, mo a motion to approve the lease and the seeker negative declaration. Motion. 
Motion by Kerry, second by Dale. Are there any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. Item eight is our personnel consent agenda. With all changes listed under A. So we need a motion to approve the personnel consent agenda. Motion, motion by Cad. Second. Second by Dale. Are there any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. And do we have anyone to introduce? I do not believe we have anyone present. So we welcome them all um, remotely and we'll make sure we pass along our congratulations when we see them in person. Okay. Uh, item nine is our board information and reports. So we have our transportation report, our enrollment report, and then our upcoming events. So tomorrow we have our Indigenous Education Committee meeting held right here at five. Uh, the 13th is Prospect Elementary uh, Open House. Um, we have our Finance Committee meeting uh, on the 18th at the Westgate. The 20th is our Personnel uh, meeting. And the 25th is our next Board of Education meeting. So hopefully we will see everybody there. We do uh, are going to go into an executive session uh, for the purpose of property acquisition and personnel. So. Thank you everybody for coming tonight. Um, I hope to see you next meeting. And I need a motion to go into executive session. Motion. Motion by Cad. Second. By Brad. Brad. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried.